I want to thank all of you for actually attending this session. And special thanks to Sir Jeremy Morris and the Morris family for making uh, these lectures even possible. I think they're really interesting. The ones in the past are absolutely fascinating. So ancient Rome provides a useful and perhaps unexpected historical lens to view the fragile relationship between citizenship, identity, and belonging. Rome is an interesting case. It constitutes one of two distinctive experiments in citizenship with the United States as the other experiment. And it is paradigmatic of the challenge of globalization. The distinctiveness of Rome and the United States lie in their founding narratives that are premised on the permeability of boundaries and the incorporation of new groups. There was no collective identity, no ethnicity, nationality, religion, or genealogy that precedes or upon which is premised Rome or the United States becoming states. As the author thought to be Quintus Cicero of the handbook on electioneering reminds Cicero about what to think about as he approaches the forum in his quest for a consulship. This is Rome, a civitas constituted out of a joining of nationes, of nations. Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. would say almost the exact same thing in early 19th century America, proclaiming America to be, quote, the Romans of the modern world, the great assimilating people. I say Rome is paradigmatic because it provides a revealing glimpse into the unresolved tensions that lie in the modern nation state, tensions now magnified by globalization. The question of belonging, of what makes a we in a nation state is commonly answered by way of formal categories of membership. The promise of the nation state is that individuals are integrated as juridical beings with a particular legal status into a civitas or state rather than by other markers of identity or belonging, such as ethnicity, race, religion, blood, tribe, or language. That is, a national identity is conferred by state membership. Now, I know I'm walking on sort of thin ice in referring to Rome here, but I think that is exactly the route that Rome went long before the emergence of the modern nation state. For Cicero, there are no people who cannot potentially become citizens. Cicero notes that one can only be a citizen of one state because different states have different legal systems. But identities are not simply issues of legal standing. As Cicero notes and on the laws, one might have two patrias or fatherlands, one by citizenship and the other by birth, by a natio. Cicero was writing as much from observation as personal experience since he was born in a municipium in the Volsian Highlands. There are, these two patrias raise the possibility of two different sources of affection or caritas, as Cicero uses the word here, one that is formal and legal, the other that is genealogical. In one, One's connection to the state is abstract, comprised of particular rights and protections that derive from formal citizenship. In the other, affection is oriented by one's relationship to a genealogy, to a history that confers identity. A troubling question emerges about the identity of the state and the identity of citizens in the state from these two different registers of affection. That question is, who are we? That question plays itself out in the encounter of tangible bodies, the juridical we, the foundation of state identity and affiliation, has certain bodily protections and legal prescriptions, and even a type of civic identity. Think, for example, about France's different laws that sought to ban the wearing of the hijab in public. But the juridical we is abstract. It is actually meant to efface a bodily history. In contrast, they the nationes that comprise a state have a genealogy. Natio actually means birth. The people of a natio, of a shared birth, are situated in a time. They bring with them their histories and they display their own bodily markers, an accent, vocabulary, mannerisms, gait, posture, hair, skin color and complexion, clothing, etc. In a juxtaposition to a tangible they, there is the haunting existential sense that we may be nothing. Since Todorov's classic study of the creation of a they, the other, in the European conquest of America, there has been considerable scholarship exploring how the other is used to justify exclusion or oppression. The binaries of Greek and, and barbarian, for example, are staples of classical scholarship. 
my focus is on a slightly different version of the other, what I would refer to as the stranger. The stranger exists within the society and is actually part of or potentially part of that society. The bodily presence of the stranger arouses suspicion or is seen as a threat, unsettling or exposing vulnerabilities or uncertainties in one's own identity. The stranger is not static. It is not a static, already defined category used to justify exclusion, but is a fluid category created to help define who we are. In Rome, and we will also see this in the United States, the stranger is constructed as a narrative by which the juridical citizen attempts to assert a genealogy of belonging. The stranger is created in order to create a genealogy for the abstract citizen. The phenomenologist Alfred Schutz provides some conceptual backdrop to this question of identity and belonging. The question of, of collective self-consciousness is what Schutz refers to as a we relationship in which we imaginatively project experiences of a shared group as constituted in the same way as one's own. What this means is that the actor assumes that the responses of others in the we group to a situation will be like mine because we share principles of comprehension. These principles are reinforced culturally by the inculcation of particular habits, attitudes, and beliefs, as well as by direct interactions in which we expect these principles to be held, upheld in the actions of others. In contrast to the we is the stranger, which entails a different orientation, one that Schutz refers to as a they orientation. One's knowledge of a they has no intrinsic reference to the persons nor to the matrix of their experiences. Rather, one's understanding of them is built up out of a synthesis of my own interpretation of their experiences that makes the character as a type of person who is basically homogeneous and repeatable. The stranger becomes anonymized from any particular context, understood by general characteristics derived from, from indirect experience, for example, experiences we have heard about, or by their functions. This is less a problem if the person is simply somewhere else, removed from so, any social interaction. But the stranger is present, challenging the assimilating identities of the nation state in a globalized world. The problem that the stranger poses for the we group is the introduction of a body with a past. The appearance of a stranger with a genealogy places into question what before had been unquestionable, namely the idea of the citizen. In the context of the continual mixing and blurring of identities that comprise members of the nation state, a we that is comprised entirely actually of theys, a destabilizing question arises. Who are we? Not as juridical beings, but as bodies with our own genealogy. To be clear, and I want to repeat, the stranger is not a pre-existing category. Rather, the characterizations and inventions of the stranger intersect with the community's continuing effort to define who they are. They are assertions of self-definition that arise in the context in which the boundaries of identity are continually blurred. The stranger is constructed as a way to imagine who we are. Rome is an interesting case because it is both very distant and very proximate, providing a useful lens for viewing how these tensions play out in our contemporary, contemporary world. Rome faced questions of who they were as a community that was comprised of different histories and attachments, as well as intertwined with histories and cultures that preceded theirs. In the third and sec second centuries BCE, Rome swallowed the Hellenistic world in successive gulps. Flooding into the system were centuries of literature, philosophy, rhetorical theory, and art, as well as the carriers of these cultural memories. Greek prisoners and freedmen who traveled with the elite, along with those who were part of everyday Roman life, serving as teachers, doctors, artists, masons, and slaves. The concern went beyond the Greeks. The Italian allies, who had been instrumental in the defeat of Hannibal and later the conquest of Macedonia, had their own traditions and identities. And where Rome largely controlled the rules of incorporation before, granting citizenship to individuals or communities based on their service to the state, the social war and its aftermath brought all that crashing down with the extension of citizenship to the Italians and later to the Gauls. Whatever was the relationship of these groups with the Romans before, their presence within the empire as participants 
rather than outside it as enemies or allies, changed the stakes. The Greeks, Italians, and Gauls were no longer a distant other, but a present stranger who brought with them their different habits, dispositions, and styles of dress, as well as their own identities and histories. The externus became the civis, conquered and formerly Roman, but dangerous because he did not necessarily share the same background or commitments. One hears this concern when Scipio Africanus responds to the popular outcry over his defense of the assassination of Tiberius Gracchus, who, interestingly, his sister was uh, Scipio's wife. When in, in, in 133 BC, he says, let people to whom Italy is a stepmother hold their tongues. Then in response to the shouts, he adds, capturing the language of bodily threat, you won't make me afraid of those I brought in chains now that they are loose. New groups on subtle relations, challenging convention, conventions, shifting power, increasing competition for office, and altering the popular voice. Scholars have interpreted the Roman reaction to the influx of these groups as driven largely by elite assertions of power and authority, as attempts, as one scholar writes, to culturally subjugate their others and to redefine themselves as an aristocracy ruling over an ever-expanding world. Power is certainly in play. But the singular focus on power, which has become the language of choice by which scholars analyze culture, reduces human motivation and experience to a hegemonic impulse. The construction of the stranger is not just directed outward by a desire to exercise power over others, but is also directed inward by questions of cultural ownership and belonging. The expansion of the Roman state as a form of military and political control and administration and the incorporation of peoples, uh, of new peoples with their own histories, required a reconfiguration of identity. If natio was used often, but not necessarily pejoratively, to refer to communities organized by lineal or ethnic descent, then Rome, as a collection of nationes, had to conceive of its, of its collective identity differently. These terms varied, civitas, populus romana, uh, civitas romana, patria, or even at times, Italia. The range of language indicates some of the struggle to project, onto a, to project a city onto an empire. More than that, though, it suggests the difficulty of projecting an ancient notion of natio as the core of identity and belonging onto a state. One can get a sense of this difficulty of definition when Cicero talks about the, quote, blood connection that exists between all Roman citizens an allusion to something more like a natio. Whatever the terms, Rome's global identity depended on its ability to define what was its own, to instill a particular memory of the past that organized and oriented a, a Roman multi-ethnic identity. Simply stated, the Romans needed to locate themselves in time. The invocation of a particular type of stranger, what I will refer to as the corrosive stranger, became a mechanism by which attempts were made to invent a Roman genealogy. In decrying some strangers as corrosive or corrupting, one is in turn asserting some purer past. Thus a genealogy is created by way of the stranger. Perhaps most famous is Cato the Elder's claim, however hyperbolic, that Rome would lose her empire when she had become infected with Greek letters. The language has a bodily reality for Cato. Greek doctors had poured into Rome, often engaging in charlatanism to pad their own pocketbooks. According to Plutarch, Cato would repeat his suspicion that he had heard of Hippocrates' statement that he would never put his skill to the service of barbarians who were enemies of Greece. Cato said all Greek physicians had taken a similar oath and urged his son to beware of them all. The Greek doctor now it becomes now literally the infecting stranger endangering the Roman body. But there is no Roman body, except in Cato's mind as something that is not the Greek body. In fact, even that distinction is problematic. There are no original Romans. Rome's own founding wanderers are mingled with Greek blood, and Roman historical accounts often derive from and depended on Greek history. Cato's origins, the first Latin work of historical prose that forgoes the previous patrician accounts of family histories, those accounts right, premised on genealogy, 
sets out to write the deeds of the Roman people, like Vero would do in the late 50s in Antiquities. What is noteworthy from the fragments we have is a picture of Italy comprised of groups with indeterminate origins. It is a community of wanderers who displace others. By creating a genealogy of wanderers, Cato gives commonality and familiarity to Rome's own legacy of conquest. Rome emerges as a community of strangers who share a dislocated past. But being dislocated from the past does not necessarily solve the problem. What it does do is it forges a new genealogy by giving a new birth, in a sense, by severing the Roman citizen from a past. And we see that language in both in Rome and the United States repeated over and over again. But critical here, and we see this later with Virgil, is that the true Roman identity is identifiable, or the true Roman is identifiable by a shared body, not a common blood, but a type of bodily disposition. Cato the Elder finds the familiarity in the severe discipline of a Sabine birthplace that he then generalizes to a Roman mos or mores. In decrying Rome's new ways, Cato plays a critical role in fashioning an image of the, quote, native simplicity of the Romans in contrast with the mix of foreign elements in a globalized Rome, embracing, as the Americans would after the revolution, the view held by others of them as backward rustics. It is the image, again, like we see with the elevation of the archetypical American citizen, of the small, frugal farmer with whom Cato aligns himself as the class of producers, uh, that, uh, of a class that produces the bravest men and the sturdiest soldiers. In this vein, Cato took over the education of his son from his Greek teacher, instilling in his son the bodily practices of how to act like a Roman, as Cato understood it throwing the javelin, fighting in armor, riding horses, boxing, enduring heat, and swimming. Even in response to the Greek doctors, Cato elevates a native and pure form of medicine with a book of recipes he had written. The stranger is not only the Greek. It is the Roman nobility who stylized themselves as Greek. Cato mocks the patrician Postumius Albanus, who wrote a history in Greek and asked the indulgence of his readers. Quote, I'm quoting here, Cato said that he might have shown him indulgence had he undertaken his task in consequence of a compulsory note of the Amphictyonic Assembly, a sarcastic reference to the ancient Greek uh, interstate assembly. The quip, the quip is aimed directly at the question of who authorizes the Roman past whether the Greeks or the Romans. Like Cato, the first century BCE military general and consul Marius would contrast the elegance, laxness, and luxurious of, uh, luxuriousness of the nobility with the coarseness, toil, and privation of the new man, like himself, the rising group of leaders who could claim no patrician ancestry, that is, who could claim no Roman genealogy. As Marius states, I cannot display ancestral images and triumphs or consulships of my forefathers, but if occasion requires, I can display trophy spheres, a distinguished service panel, banner, medals, and other military decorations, as well as scars on my breast. These are my ancestral images. These my nobility, not left to me by inheritance as theirs is, but a nobility sought by my own innumerable efforts and perils. In fact, the scars connect Marius to a genealogy, referencing the prowess of Rome's true ancestors, such as Lucius Sisius Dentatus, a tribune who won eight single combats and had the distinction of 44 scars on his front and none on his back. Or Marcus Sergius, who was wounded 23 times, suffered from crippled hands and feet, and still served in campaigns. And they reference the courage of the common soldier who counts the scars from standing the ground. Sallust describes Marius's, quote, unspoiled nature because of his Roman rather than Greek training. That is, there is a Roman purity of its origins that is constructed by way of Greek impurity. There isn't just one stranger with one definition. The identification of the stranger shifts to form new narratives of belonging. If Cato and Marius sought to craft one version of Roman purity against the Greek stranger, Cicero imagined another. 
but they started interestingly in the same place in what Cicero refers to as Romulus's cesspool, the mix of foreigners and, uh, and wanderers that come to Rome. More explicitly than Cato, Cicero recognized the ties of citizenship. Recalling the founding myth, Cicero views legal protections as a bond that extends to the bodies of Roman citizens. Quote, poor men of humble birth sail across the seas to shores they have never seen before, where they find themselves among strangers and cannot always have with them acquaintances to vouch for them. And in those moments, what it means to be Roman, Roman invoking now a, a notion of state protections, is that they will be safe from magistrates and safe with the people. But even with Cicero's endorsement of the bonds of state membership, there is a looming unfamiliarity. For Cicero, the influx of, prevent, the influx of provincials is seen as vulgarizing the language, bringing to Rome traces of their non-Roman past. In one dialogue, Cicero has his close friend Pomponia sound the alarm. The influx of many impure speakers coming from different places has led to a deterioration of public oratory at a magnitude qualitatively different than in the past. Cicero, by way of Crassus, a famous orator who dies in 91 BC, too talks about how the race publica is deluged with vulgar and half-educated opinions. In part, Cicero through Crassus is drawing a contrast to orators who add rustic elements to their speeches in order to lend themselves dignity by connecting their speech to the old ways. Such archaizing gestures appear to be, quote, copying not the orators of old days, but the farm laborers. Cicero is also referring to the colloquialisms, accents, and lack of urban color that is characteristic of foreign oratory for him, thus situating true oromanness in a type of urban vernacular that Cicero, by way of Crassus, associates with a particular accent peculiar to the Roman race and to our city. Rome's, Cicero's focus on oratory tells us something about Rome's own emergent identity in the intervening century since Cato the Elder. As Brutus exclaims at one point in a rephrase that recalls Cato and, and, and Horace will later repeat, for the one thing in which, Greek, in which conquered Greece still remained our conqueror, that is rhetoric, we have now wrested from her. Oratory appears as the foundation of Roman political life and identity, the basis of interaction between elites and the populace, by which elites gain distinction, the source of Roman prestige, and a critical mechanism by which the res publica is governed. Like Cato the Elder's efforts to construct a pure Roman past in which he is an heir, so Cicero places himself and in turn Brutus within a genealogy of Roman oratory that he constructs. In this genealogy, Cicero's Brutus, a dialogue, distills the purity of Rome's history. Cicero fends off the vulgarizations by provincials, as well as Pomponius's elevation of Greek over Roman models. Though recognizing the contributions of Greek oratory and his own training in it, Cicero continually recalls the Roman models that guided his education. Cicero elevates his history over others, digressing to describe how earlier preserved orations, usually funeral speeches, distort Roman history by recalling false triumphs, false numbers of consulships, or false associations of plebeian with patrician status. He similarly corrects the record, criticizing Romans for ignoring the greatness of Cato the Elder and identifies in Quintus Catullus a change from the old Roman style of the, uh, uh, from the, a change from the old Roman style to the modern style with, interestingly, uncorrupted Latin that is learned and well-read, an attribute that shows up frequently in his characterizations of other orators. But that has passed, and by the end of Brutus, there is a sense of disarray as the race publica fragments. Cicero sees Brutus and himself as, quote, in this, the, the language in this is wonderful, as, quote, the guardians of orphaned eloquence. Let us keep her within our walls, protected by a custody worthy of her liberal lineage. Let us repel the pretensions of these upstart and impudent suitors and guard her purity like that of a virgin growing to womanhood. And so far as we can, shield her from the advances 
of rash admirers. What emerges for Cicero is a contending version of pure Romanness that acquires form against the outlines of the impure stranger. Cato elevates the, farm, the farmer tilling the rocky, savvy soil to craft a version of Roman genealogy. Cicero at times invokes this rural simplicity, but he also urbanizes that identity, locating true Romanness in the sophistication of the city in which there is no note or flavor of provincialism, nor any rustic roughness or provincial solecisms. Against the affectations on the one hand and the vulgarizations on the other, the purity of language is portrayed as a return to something more familiar. That familiarity is naturalized by way of a Hellenistic framework of progress in which language like the arts evolves from archaic harshness, elements of which are visible in Cato the Elder, according to Cicero, toward more natural renderings that display variations of rhythm and tone. With a natural and now pure Latin words transparently convey meaning. It appears as, quote, the easy and familiar speech of daily life, as Caesar is quoted. It is part of what every true Roman is heir, in which proper Latin is learned at home and in daily intercourse. There was a time, as Cicero has Pompeius remarked, in, uh, uh, remark in, in, as, as, as Pompeius now imagines this sort of pure past, that everyone employed good usage unless they were raised outside Rome or some crudeness of home environment had tainted their speech. The stranger cannot stop being the stranger, marked by speech that makes them unfamiliar and regressive, but also serving to organize a pure Roman identity. I can't resist uh, um, adding a striking parallel uh, about Noah Webster, and some of this is talked about in a book that's coming out from uh, Cambridge. Um, I, I, Noah Webster is perhaps best known for the dictionary uh, in, in early America shortly after the revolution. In particular, Noah Webster sought to craft a pure American genealogy and identity against both an English one and what he saw as the forces of vulgarization within America. Even as America became a constitutional state, there was little consensus about a vision of naturehood. There were persistent regional, local, and ethnic rivalries and attachments, and there were rival and more popular spellers in textbooks that retained British spellings. In his dissertations on the English language, Webster starts with America's founding by immigrants, suggesting the need to destroy the differences of dialect which our ancestors brought from their native countries. That is to say, to get, to, to get rid of the genealogy. There are vicious pronunciations, which prevailed extensively among the common people of this country, as well as provincial prejudices that originate in the trifling differences of dialect. Webster's critique is not just pointing downward toward the common people, but also upward toward a particular elite, especially the grammarians and language instructors who, and Webster sounds an awful lot like Cicero here, learn Greek and Latin, but are ignorant of their own tongues. When Webster writes that knowledge and intercourse are embarrassed by differences of language, he is saying more than that it is difficult to talk when people do not understand each other. Webster conceives of language in its origins as expressing the condition and movement of physical bodies. It is by way of language that we not only describe bodies, but also communicate our bodies within the expectations of a culture. We enunciate or construct sentences in a particular way, speak with a particular cadence, or use some words and not others, all which authorizes our recognition of each other as we rather than they. Webster pursued several remedies. In his spelling book, he includes the states, capitals, counties, and inhabitants so that children would learn about the geography of their country. In his lifelong work of creating a dictionary, Webster attempts, like the Roman author Varro, whom he describes as the most celebrated authors of antiquity on the subject of language, to uncover the primal sense of original words by comparing words and language. The aim is to purify the language from palpable errors, and I'm quoting uh, Webster here, reduce the number of its anomalies, give it more regularity and consistency, banish pronunciations that fit the fashion of the day, and furnish a standard of our vernacular tongue. 
reversing the efforts of grammarians, Webster looks to understand how the language is used rather than concocting a scheme for how it should be constructed. As Cicero writes, grammar is formed on language and not language on grammar. He seeks to fix language by the rules of language itself and the general practice of the nation, which constitute propriety in speaking. Webster is not making an argument for a different language. He is, given, he is giving American English a pure genealogy that distinguishes the United States from the corruption and decline he associates with Europe. Sounding like Cato the Elder, Webster points to the identity of this purified English. Quote, the English language, when pronounced according to the genuine composition of its words, is a nervous masculine language, well adapted to popular eloquence. And it is not improbable that there may be some connection between the manly character of the language and the freedom of the British and American constitutions. Yet lurking in these etymologies, and this shows up prominently in Varro as well, are the diverse origins of a Roman and American language, like Rome and the United States themselves. Webster writes of this continual infusion of foreign words, quote, I would compel them to submit to the formalities of naturalization before they should be admitted to the rights of citizenship. I would convert them into English words or reject them. In these heady days of forming a nation state, to be an American word, like an American, requires shedding one's earlier identities and, and, and acquiring a purer one. I use these examples of Rome in the United States to stimulate, maybe even broaden, our thinking about some of these same tensions in our contemporary globalizing world. In fact, my forthcoming book on Rome in the United States is motivated in part by my interest in thinking through what I see as a global phenomenon, the fragmenting or weakening of the primacy of state identities and the assertion of particular exclusive, uh, 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 and the assertions of particular exclusive national genealogies. This questioning of state identities is not the exclusive domain of right-wing national movements, but is also an argument made in left critiques of the liberal state and liberal universalism. The United States has now joined this phenomena as citizens have divided into two camps, maybe more, who view each other as strangers. One that claims a white religious national genealogy, the other asserting multi-ethnic ethnic genealogies. We make a mistake to identify the rise of Donald Trump, for example, as the cause. He is a symptom of a division that is grounded in both economic dislocation and a, and a cultural schism with a long history, fostered in a variety of media outlets of a country under siege by an array of strangers, minorities, immigrants, internationalists, the financial elite, the deep state, and even to recall Cato the Elder, the medical establishment. At issue in the language used is an existential question that always accompanied the founding myth, the one that now sharply divides the country. Who are we? One answer to the question is a crass white nationalism that has merged with, the, with a corrupted Christian evangelism, but also takes on aspects of Cato's rusticity. Uh, it's located in rural areas. On the other side are those trying to make sense of a multi-ethnic population, but whose Ciceronian vernacular has become a quickly evolving vocabulary of political correctness. If one side desires the subordination of the state to a version of white nationalism, the other risks dividing the state into islands of culture who are afraid or unable to talk to each other. In any case, neither side can stand the other. Trump's virtue in both his successful 2016 campaign and his unsuccessful 2020 campaign is to clear away the underbrush of nuance by taking aim at the founding myth that underlies these questions of identity. The dislocating journey of immigrants now becomes an invasion, dramatized in images of a caravan coming up from Mexico. Trump famously claimed in the announcement of his candidacy, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems and they're bringing those problems to us. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some I assume are good people. 
Now, criticism of this statement focused on the final several sentences, but there is a telling part that gets lost. Quote, they're not sending you. The United States appears not as a melting pot, a term with its own problematic history, or as a beacon, but as a dumping ground. The immigrant is a, the, the immigrant is a stranger, not you. Not only do other countries give us their worst, but the hidden, undocumented stranger dilutes, uh, causing a reapportionment of resources through the census, a concern uh, that plays itself, uh, that, 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 a replay of a concern uh, that, that happened similarly in Rome. Thus, Trump issued an executive order and a memorandum to exclude undocumented immigrants from the census. Moreover, residing within the United States is the menacing stranger who retains old histories and identities. Trump often told the story during his campaign rallies, as he said in a rally in Alabama, that on September 11th, he watched when the World Trade Center came tumbling down, and I watched in Jersey City, New Jersey, where thousands and thousands of people were cheering as that building was coming down. In talking about Syrian refugees at an Iowa rally in 2016, Trump also would read the lyrics to L. Wilson's 1968 song, The Snake, the story of a tender woman who nursed a sickly snake back to health, but then was attacked by the vicious snake to which the snake responds to her cry, quote, oh, shut up, silly woman. You knew damn well I was a snake before you took me in. On Fox News with Sean Hannity, he said of Muslims who immigrate to the United States, assimilation has been very hard. It's almost, I won't say non-existent, but it gets to be pretty close. And I'm talking about second and third generation. They come, they don't for some reason, there's no real assimilation. He campaigned on what he referred to openly as the Muslim ban. As his campaign issued a statement, Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. He then issued the first executive order with the ban uh, on January 27th, 2017. It is not just the threat raised by the permeable boundaries, by the permeable boundaries of incorporation as, group, as groups journey to the new land. It is also the danger of mobility of those groups who threaten familiar bodies. In the 2020 re-election campaign, the most prominent strangers was the urban one associated with low income, Black Lives Matter and Antifa. These groups tear at the fabric of the nation, not just through, and I'm quoting here, rampant crime, violence, and treason, sedition, and insurrection, but also as they move out of the city, threatening, quote, suburban women and their suburban lifestyle dream. In one of the more striking inversions of the myth of American mobility, Trump tweeted, suburban voters are pouring into the Republican Party because of the violence in Democrat-run cities and states. If Biden gets in, this violence is coming to the suburbs and fast. You could say goodbye to your American dream. Employing language, suggesting an existential connection between identity and community and bodily survival. Trump exclaimed at one, uh, one campaign rally, this is a struggle for the survival of our nation, believe me. In his acceptance speech, he asserted that when he takes office in January, quote, safety will be restored. That safety, of course, culminated four years later in a January 6th insurrection in which supporters sought to overturn a democratic election. We're not talking about fringe movements. We are talking about a much deeper division within the United States that divides the state into nations of strangers who are mutually incomprehensible and antagonistic to each other. It is hard it is hard to say what, that, what the future looks like, whether the state remains a viable locus of identity or the state fragments into nations, whether we're talking about what used to be Czechoslovakia or Yugoslavia in the past, or Ethiopia or Spain, or even the UK and the United States in the present. It should be noted that there was no consensus about whether there is a crisis, the causes of the crisis, or the potential solutions. For some, a state identity, in particular a democratic state identity, can be reinvigorated by particular institutional reforms to better align interest with, with outcome. That is, in their mind, the fragmentation of the state is caused by the failure of the state 
to answer to the interests of the citizens. There's certainly some evidence for this, especially among younger citizens who see political leaders as out of touch. Others talk about a new or inclusive patriotism, whether guided by elites who can reorient dangerous populism or by a more communitarian belief that increased popular participation and deliberation in a social movement can bring about the sense of belonging. For example, Etzioni claims that individual citizens need to come together and decide among each other which direction their country is to follow and what values are to be advanced. But the state does not necessarily fare better. Etzioni imagines a movement around global, around global governance that can transfer loyalty from the nation state to an imagined global community. But in any case, these approaches, these approaches mask the embodied aspects of politics, that politics is not simply an abstraction or a realm for the mediation of interests. And this gets at some of what Ellen was saying in the introduction. Politics is the arena of identity formation, contestation, and articulation. It is about how one sees oneself in relationship to a larger community narrative. The problem is that we are in a time when participants, whether elites or the populace, have become abstract strangers to each other. We neither trust nor comprehend the other. We talk in separate discourses, and we see each other as the threat to our own identity. Certainly, there were reforms in the United States that would help dampen the movement to the extremes. Though the fact that these are global issues suggests that a reform here and another reform there does not really get at the underlying phenomenon. There are three other more likely directions, none of them particularly satisfying, but each already occurring. The future of the state may rest on variations of electoral ma manipulation and suppression, wild swings and citizen protections depending on who holds power, or versions of authoritarianism to effectively suppress divergent national voices. The problem of a politics of strangers, at least as it has emerged in the United States, is both political paralysis and unaccountability, perpetuating a perception that the democratic state is unable to project the community into the future. Over several convulsive decades, the Roman Republic would disintegrate into strangers, into strangers who shared neither a common purpose nor an identity, identity. The Republic was not reconstituted, as Augustus and some scholars would claim. It was held in place by exhaustion at the bottom and autocracy at the top. It ended with a reconceptualization of the state as something akin to the princess extended household. The United States now has had one experiment in autocracy. Interestingly, one that resembled what it actually would look like for a political leader to view the state as an extended household. More sobering is the surprisingly large portion of the population that says that violence and a single powerful leader may be necessary for the survival of their, of their vision of the community. What is decidedly unclear, and I want to be more hopeful, is whether there is or can be again a shared vision of a citizen future. Thank you everyone so much.